this tutorial uh, provides an overview of the US uh, political society and culture and by that I think about the, the, the structures like political culture and political economy uh, organization outside of um, the political system if you will I'll start with just a brief discussion on uh, norm or ex ex exception and then an overview of political culture then political economy and then I'll finish with uh, small talk on civil society uh, and how it has mattered for for thinking about in the US as a political community so first of all norm or exception it's really interesting to um, discuss American political culture and America as a political phenomenon uh, from the point of view of, of political science because of course the majority of political scientists in the world are American most of us are, are American and that means that great many of the concepts that in, in analytical tools and theories that you will find in political science have been developed in an American context. It also means that a great many of political scientists have assumed that the United States is the normal political system uh, and uh, thus the political system by which to judge other political systems. Uh, and and uh, that's um, a bit tricky. Uh, because, of course, other political systems come from other political cultures, other traditions, other histories. So uh, what is the norm in politics and what isn't? In many ways, if you look at the United States from, a, for example, a European point of view, uh, the United States actually stands out as an exception in many ways, not the norm. Uh, so, uh, what is normal? What is not normal? Uh, this is where things like ethnocentrism can creep in, and alas, often has in political science. So this is something for us to remember as scholars, uh, to be very cautious about what we, what we call normal, and think about our own position and where we come from when we speak about a political subject. Now, uh, the United States political culture of course, uh, the United States has been forged by wars with Britain and itself, uh, the, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Civil War. And, and this has been uh, of fundamental importance for, for uh, the sense of itself. Independence Day is, is the celebration of, of uh, the start of its separation from Britain and, and of course, the, the War of Independence is a narrative based on, on this uh, sense of uh, self-governance and so on. Tremendous importance as, as historical uh, narratives for, for American political culture. Uh, but there is a, a series of other uh, important uh, moments and processes as well. So for example, uh, the United States has, has for a long time seen, seen itself as a melt, melting pot of cultures. People come uh, from other places to the United States uh, to join this melting pot. Uh, it has also been the birthplace of Republican democracy, uh, all this constitution still active in the world, uh, and that's going to, to, to affect the political culture. Uh, if we go by, by ideologies, you will have strong liberalism, and, and liberalism here in the sense of John Locke uh, and uh, uh, classical liberals uh, rather than, than um, how the word is contemporary used in, in uh, American uh, debates and, and politics. Uh, conservatism as well, uh, though not necessarily Tory conservatism in the British sense, um, uh, so this has more to do with an orientation towards uh, religion, towards family values, and towards uh, economic conservatism in many in many ways. You will also have this focus on democracy, civil liberties, populism, uh, the notion that genuine democracy comes from uh, having a lot of, of, of popular uh, control over institutions in, in, 
society. For instance, uh, the election of, of sheriffs or, or judges on lower levels in the political system, uh, which uh, many uh, people would find uh, as, as, as strange choices for, for elected office in other political systems. Of course, a great focus on individualism. We have the gun regulation debate, of course, uh, which is uh, quite unique to the US. Uh, and also the healthcare debate uh, that you won't find uh, uh, expressed or manifested the same way in other entrenched democracies. Um, you also have the, these traits of American exceptionalism, uh, the notion that America is exceptional compared to any other countries. Uh, this tied to this idea of manifest destiny that it has somehow, whether by a higher power or simply by its unique history, a destiny to, to realize uh, liberty in, in a way that, and, and uh, the American dream in a way that, that no other place has. Uh, it, it's also uh, a quite weak state, which ties back to the, these ideas of uh, liberalism and, and populism and individualism and uh, the, the skepticism, inherent skepticism towards the powers of, of the state. Uh, that's that's really uh, wired into the system with, with its checks and balances. As much as debates can get heated, uh, Americans do tend to debate issues a lot, but they do not question the regime. Uh, there, there is no significant momentum towards tearing up the constitution. There is, in fact, quite the opposite. If, if anything, there is a very strong debate on uh, what is the proper interpretation of the Constitution. So the Constitution is alive and well in the American debate. And uh, there is pretty much uh, no one of significance, no group of significance, no uh, uh, side in the political debate of significance uh, that uh, would even raise the idea of tearing up the Constitution. Uh, and uh, coupled with that, uh, uh, Americans uh, do accept the idea of the weak state because, of course, uh, of, of this tradition of, of viewing the state uh, with, with skepticism. Also uh, uh, coupled with that is a functional apathy. Uh, the uh, US uh, voters uh, are, uh, seem very reluctant to turn up at the polls at least when it comes to presidential elections. Uh, you will find a lower vo voter turnout uh, for uh, presidential elections than uh, would be acceptable in many other countries. Some people in, in the US says that this is a sign that voters are content with how things are and that's why they're staying at home. Uh, and others consider this uh, a huge problem. Uh, Regardless of why uh, it's happening, it is a trait that, that separates uh, the United States from other entrenched democracies. Uh, and the electorate, uh, speaking of, of the electorate, it is as evenly divided as at, at any point in recent history. Um, the the uh, two-party system has led to a, a type of debate polarized between these two parties. And even though Americans have had a, a strong sense of party identification, it is now at an all time low. Uh, so uh, the contest for the middle should thus be, be uh, more intense than, than it has been in the past, because there are more people that could be per persuaded to change their vote. The U.S. is also, uh, when it comes to political economy, the home of capitalism, the, the world's largest economy. And as such, it spends more on research and development and, and is home to more multinational corporations than, than other uh, nations. Uh, it also has the greatest discrepancy between rich and poor in any uh, entrenched democracy. And that's going to affect uh, how, how the political conversation goes and the political culture. And of course, historical uh, uh, world leadership, uh, uh, the US as the world hegemon, the dominant power of the world, the superpower, the remaining superpower of the world. The question is to what extent uh, that position is now uh, being challenged with, by the rise of other economies in the world, China, the BRICS, uh, the, the European Union as a, as a bloc, if the European Union can overcome its economic problems. So all of this, of course, is also going to, to affect uh, the political culture uh, as well uh, of, of Americans. 
A final note here on, on uh, political culture and society pertains to the civil society of, of the United States. Uh, it's uh, depicted as traditionally a very diversified civil society and as early as in the early 19, 1800s uh, the Tocqueville French uh, scholar uh, traveled the United States because he was curious about how, how this republic could function and he argued that uh, it did because of its vibrant civil society because of the tendency of Americans to get together in volunteer based organizations and uh, manage communal matters together. Uh, so this is what he would have described as a vibrant civil society. Uh, and of course uh, you will see that, that if you look through history how the new social movements, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the environmentalist movement of, of the late 1960s, uh, how important the momentum that these mo movements gained in the U United States, uh, how important that momentum has been for the spread of these mo movements to other parts of the world, uh, Europe and, and so on. Uh, so uh, it it's really uh, connects to the, the American uh, populist, but also um, uh, tradition, but also this, this tradition of, of uh, mutual aid uh, and mutual uh, volunteer-based civil society uh, where, where citizens come together for mutual benefit. Now, some scholars have noted that uh, there has been actually significant demobilization over the last decades, and this has been noted with some concern. Uh, if we're to look at the types of networks that come out of this type of civil society, most classically scholars will label the United States as uh, a, a system of government with a pl with pluralist networks. And this means that there will be several uh, NGOs, several interest groups, several maybe lobbyists, several non-government actors that are trying to approach uh, governments to gain their attention, to gain favor, and to get their agenda done within the legislative system. Uh, in these networks, power is uh, typically widely dispersed. Interest groups, they, they compete with each other. Uh, and there was a study in the mid 20th century, classic study uh, on uh, the, the municipality of New Haven to investigate whether this classic description of American politics was actually uh, to be found in reality. And, and this study argued that it was indeed. There was a dispersed power structure no single actor could be sure of, of always having the power of, of over the agenda in this study. Uh, later studies following up on this one have actually qualified this and said that yes it's pluralist uh, but uh, corporations tend to get preferential treatment so they tend to have one leg up in these negotiations. Um, also uh, unions uh, tend to be traditionally weaker. Uh, but of course there are other actors that can uh, enter into the policy communities and enter into the the, the negotiations with the state, uh, such as you know the civil rights movements or the feminist groups or environmentalist groups that will try to present their agendas against those of, of other interests. Uh, so that's a type of dynamic that, that you will see typically see in, in a community with in a policy community with pluralist networks. We're looking at social movements currently, uh, we can look at the new left and the new right. And so. Um, uh, the new left uh, having emerged in the 1960s and highlighting uh, more identity-based issues, feminism, uh, environmentalism, uh, civil rights, and so on. Uh, and also anti-nuclear, pro-peace, uh, all these movements that came out of the 1960s. By the 1970s, support for, for, for uh, many of these uh, movements had waned, uh, but uh, today we can see still the uh, inheritors of the new left in, in a movement like the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, so uh, th these types of movements are still, still uh, certainly around. Uh, there is an equivalent uh, on the new right, uh, starting with the Reagan's Republicans in the 1980s, and of course today uh, the Tea Party uh, with its 
uh, strong populist uh, tendencies. It really frames itself as being the people against the government. Uh, so uh, we can really see that both sides in the political spectrum here are, are tapping into social movement and uh, popular mobilization to, to present their agendas. And that's an overview of US political uh, culture and uh, society. Uh, I hope you found that uh, useful.